Welcome to Cloud at Microsoft, Subject Matter Expert or SME Roundtable. Hi, I'm Sherry Bettine. I'll be your host today. We are the IT Showcase team, and we love to talk to you, our customers, about how Microsoft does IT. Today, I'm here with many of our cloud SMEs that have implemented cloud-based solutions here at Microsoft. We want to learn a little bit about you as well, so we are posting a question in the Bing Pulse window and would like to know what are the business drivers that are driving your migration to the cloud. While you're answering that question, you could be posting questions for our SMEs, and I would also like our SMEs to introduce themselves. So we'll start with Ken. Hello, I'm Ken Knight. I'm an enterprise architect at Microsoft IT. I've been working on cloud strategy, cloud adoption, and cloud platform solutions for the past four years. Hi, my name is Arun Maningal. I'm a senior software engineer. My team is responsible for design and implementation of intelligent hyperscale services that support Microsoft's critical operations and businesses. I have my team working on multiple cloud services and would want to share my experiences here with you. Hi, I'm Jim Adams. I'm with Microsoft IT as a business program manager. Um, in the past, I've uh, been responsible for migration and cloud adoption. I am David Johnson. I am a program manager architect responsible for our Office 365 services and strategy. And I've been in the process of, of redesigning our solutions from on-prem to the cloud. My name is Eric Slippern. I'm a software design engineer here at MSIT. I've spent the last several years working on moving a number of our HR enterprise line of business applications to the cloud. And most recently, I've been working with our work-life productivity innovation team on how to improve employee productivity with Internet of Things. Okay, great. We are going to make every effort in the next hour to get through all of your questions. However, if we don't, we'll stay behind in the studio and continue answering your questions and post the extended footage along with this video on our Microsoft.com slash IT Showcase site. And with that, we'll get started with our first question. This question is for you, Ken. What is Microsoft doing to ensure you are secure in the cloud? Oh, uh, we're doing a lot. Um, there's Azure Security Center, which has um, a lot of it's like an uh, umbrella that uh, has a whole bunch of other modules that it calls out to for each of the different PaaS services and offerings in Azure. Um, each of them supply te telemetrics and event notifications so that it's easy for you to take action for any issues, security issues that might be uh, going on. Um, in addition to that, it does a lot more than just security. Um, it also does uh, recommendations, engines, and things like that. And so that's just the beginning. For Microsoft internally, um, we have our security team. Um, they're modifying their approach to security at Microsoft, where before we used to audit all of the different projects before we released them to the internet. Now they're building tooling that we take advantage of using GitHub and repositories, which we embed in the engineering process so that we're secure up front. And so they've uh, figured out each of the PaaS services and how they want them secured out of the box. Uh, we implement that in our engineering cycle and we become far more secure as baked into our engineering process. I mean, that's just the beginning. We're also working on security um, with our networking team to help secure Azure. Uh, we're working with the Azure product group to make sure that all of those issues that we find are baked into the product. Um, and we do this uh, as soon as possible, especially before customers experience any of those issues. Um, also, our security team inside Microsoft IT is very, very, um, what's the right word? Um, super, super critical at being secure mm -hmm. because we want to make sure that we don't have any issues. Um, we, it's we, a scary world out there yeah. today. Yeah, and, so and the palette of, of tools available uh, are much more vast than we were able to provide internally mm -hmm. um, uh, at Microsoft. So we find that uh, our assets, uh, all of our assets, are actually now more secure 
right. where they are than we were ever able to make it. Well, in fact, that's something certainly for Office, Office 365 mm -hmm. that we've done a lot of work to. Our assessment with security, our corporate security team, you know, like any customer, you're going to be, you're going to make a decision as to what you're willing to place in the cloud. And like an Office 365, we had to decide what kind of content we were going to allow. And we've determined now that we are content is more secure in Office 365 than it was on-prem simply because of the level of controls, auditability, and safeguards we have in place on Office 365 are far beyond, beyond what we ever had on our on-prem farms. And we can, while it's doable on-prem, the cloud gives us a lot more. And just to add to what Ken was talking about earlier, there is Office 365 itself has a trust center and a lot of other core in-product capabilities for how to make sure that services are secured, DL, digital, uh, DLP solutions in place, and so on, just to make sure that, again, the, your content off of C65 is well protected. And also, I have a question. Um, you were saying we're, we're driving secure um, components earlier in the engineering cycle. Do they still do a review at the end before the code's released in production? Um, if needed. So we have an assessment, um, self-assessment. So in, in a lot of cases, most of the cases, um, we have tooling to help you do that yourself. So self-attestation. In the high-risk ones, we will be more involved during the engineering process to make sure that that's done and reviewed and maybe even white box tested and black box tested. So we may test so it, it depends. after reading the code. Yeah, the, mm -hmm. it, it, it's a balance. We right. have only so many resources. We put them on the higher priority ones, the more yeah. mission critical ones. And, and we classify our applications and content as well. Certainly our sites and apps we classify as to what level of security we uh, basically, what kind of content we're going to be dealing with and therefore what kind of controls we want to make sure are put in place. Right. And our culture is conditioned to recognize those classifications and to automatically think about it. Uh, Every six months, we go through training. Every person that has a network, uh, has access to our network, has to go through that security training uh, where they are just pounded with, with the, the concept of being stewards of our own uh, PII. And to the point about tooling that Ken mentioned, it is not just tooling bef during the engineering process. It is also the instrumentation itself that helps us d derive analytics and know if the uh, usage is not in a certain um, in a in a proper manner, or it, it's being used As in a modified manner. Right. So that helps us gain that insight also. And what ha what the cli cloud allows you is with tools like application insights, and um, that helps you get that centralized um, application monitoring in into a dashboard view, and you're able to better react to any security issues as well. In addition to the practices that we use during our engineering lifecycle. So the cloud just makes it easier. Uh, far faster. We're, before we had to build and deploy these um, metrics yep. and monitoring systems ourselves as part of the application team. Mm -hmm. Now you get it as a configuration exercise. Yep. And the part we have to understand is that this is the collective knowledge that we've derived across multiple applications that get baked into the products like Application Insights. Mm -hmm. So you're not really reinventing each and every mm -hmm. uh, failures that other teams have encountered. Mm -hmm. It is getting baked into the product. So y you get the benefit out of the box without having to invest heavily in resources who have to know everything about security, what is there out there. That's the big problem. So the metrics and the in instrumentation is getting richer and richer. Absolutely. So what kinds of things do we look at for instrumentation for our apps? Great, great question that. So first of all, uh, we are now, with the, with the movement to the cloud, we are really focused on scenarios that are enabled. We build a tool for a certain scenario. We expect or anticipate that the usage would be in a certain pattern. Uh, the metrics that we, uh, the collection metrics are focused on the usage and the, the pattern of usage. From that, we are able to deduce whether A, the scenario for which that capability was built is being used for that purpose or is being used for some other purpose. So that becomes a critical uh, feedback loop which we can incorporate back into a product, uh, purely from a usage perspective. The second part is the uh, security around uh, the audits or uh, as to who is getting access to it, mm. from what places. Because are, is it appropriate? Exactly. Is it what we want? And the geographic locations from where they are accessing. For example, one classic example is the support tools that we build. 
the agent facing tools. Uh, we know that certain agents are only allowed to access these tool sets from certain places. Traditionally, we would have followed processes like whitelisting and whatnot, which are easy to circumvent in the modern world through proxies and what have you. Uh, with proper instrumentation that also maps IP and the latency aspect uh, of, hey, if, if the person is really accessing from that location, there is a certain latency associated mm -hmm. with it, and that analytics comes out um, you know, uh, front and center in your dashboard saying that there's some, something wrong. You might have to look at the network pattern, so you get that hook as well. And a lot of that identity management is just baked in, in protection. It's baked right into Azure identity management. So we, there's nothing even we have to build as exactly. IT. Exactly. Yeah, as far as turning on application insights now with app service, it's just a checkbox. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. In the old days, you know, five years ago, <laughs> we would go for every line of business application we'd build, we'd go through this exercise of figuring out what our telemetry strategy is, monitoring strategy. Now it's just out of the box with app insights. And, yeah. and we can also use app application analytics now gives us a query language where we can go and take a big data approach to, to all these things that are logged through application insights, tie it up to Power BI, and get uh, deep analytics on what's happening with our applications. And it, and it really is, is, it's all about the live site now. With, right. with application insights, we have, you know, we've combined our, our uh, engineering and service engineering and software engineering roles. So we've really got a DevOps outlook on this. We've got our dashboards on top of application insights. We're looking at these daily, hourly, seeing exactly what's going on with our application. So what kinds of things do you look for in your instrumentation? What are you monitoring? So uh, we don't want to look at just availability of the application itself. We want to look at availability of the scenarios. So we can tell exactly which scenarios are being used um, and, and, and how impactful they are to our users. So we've created some custom uh, uh, visualizations that we can just plug into our App Insights dashboard. And, we can, and, and we'll see exactly you know, how, how different users are using our application. We can also use flighting to control which features are turned on for which user population, so we can do A-B testing. For example, um, you know, with our, with our IFT, IoT scenarios, we're looking at a couple different ways to give users visibility into uh, how, how areas of their workspace are being leveraged. And we can see which ones of those are being most impactful to our users, and then we can say, okay, well, they uh, I'm not really using this method to find a, a free room to go to, but this one is really popping for folks so we can uh, tune our application uh, without releasing code just by flighting the two different features to, to tune that experience. You can pick which one your users actually want to use. Exactly. And yeah. then deprecate. Which one they're using, yeah. Deprecate the one they're not, and that way you're supporting only the top needed function. Exactly. But it's, it's really, really cool because now he only has one environment, production. He doesn't need a pre-production environment. Yep. You don't have to spend all the energy managing a pre-production mm -hmm. if you do your testing in production with flighting. It's, it's just brilliant. Um, the other thing on the security center that I found really, really cool is Azure Security Center is starting to use observational patterns and finding anomalies. So you had mentioned a brilliant anomalistic pattern from this set of IP addresses we're seeing a incre dramatic increase in latency. It may be nothing. It may be just the case that people are starting to use cell phones and they're on the yep. cellular network in that zone and that might be a legitimate thing. Mm -hmm. But at least you get an alert saying, hey, you know, this, this is out of the normal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why yep, you invest exactly. In and that's, that's the, and the delta between the feedback being provided by the end users and it being visible to the engineering team for them to incorporate changes has reduced drastically. Mm -hmm. Because you are seeing as the usage is happening mm -hmm. and you're not re really relying on someone's assumption or a perception of, hey, this is what is anticipated. You're really relying on raw data and you are making conscious data-driven decisions, no longer uh, presumptive decisions that leads to a lot of wastages traditionally that we had. A question on flighting. Um, so how granular can you make that flighting? And IT organizations out there who are used to uh, the, the traditional release cycles, how difficult is it to implement flighting in mm. the cloud? Uh, it's, it's, it's not difficult. You do need to have a framework to support it, but we've, we've got a framework. We're actually using one that, that is uh, internal to MSIT, but there are um, partners like LaunchDarkly is a partner that uh, integrates straight with Visual Studio Online. 
Um, but we are able to flight as to individual users if we want to. Basically, any we can define any set of our, our standard attributes we know about a person, you know, which where they sit, you know, what group they in, cost center. Um, and we have a, a, a page where we can go and target for each environment which users we want to enable a feature for. So we'll do, we kind of take a ringed approach to most of our things. So we'll start out with ring zero and just test everything internally with our team. Then oftentimes it's in, just in our building and then we'll go uh, you know, across Puget Sound, for mm -hmm. example. So, so re really it's just instrumenting the code with an if statement, calls out to the flighting system, flighting to cert system determines whether to call this procedure or the other procedure, yep. right? Whether, yep, exactly. So it's basically instrumentation. Yep. One of the reasons for uh, deploying to a pre-production environment was to isolate any issues that you might have from bringing down the production environment. Mm -hmm. Have we had any instances of something like that happening in a flighting situation? That's uh, no. So that we, it's interesting. We we've actually just recently kind of split in in work life productivity. We have a, a half of our team is focused on enterprise and half of our team is focused on R and D. And what we'll do is everything that the R and D team does, we want to integrate into enterprise as soon as possible. So all we do is we have a standard where they they just wrap that with flighting, and we can plug it straight into our enterprise branch. And we're and we know that we have all the switches to turn that on and off, so that it really mitigates all our risk. Adding to that framework point and your question, right? Hey, how do we the issues that we um, encounter when mm -hmm. we flight mm -hmm. something? Mm -hmm. uh, this is where the telemetry coupled with analytics and the life side focus comes into force. Anytime we find that our service is uh, not available, there is an alert triggered, which is you know, on a cell phone, literally, on the person who is on call, which effectively means that there is a person immediately monitoring it. And because it is through the Azure portal or any other experience that is available over the internet, he or she can determine that this was due to this flighting that has been enabled, and that can be easily rolled back. So it's really a combination of multiple things. How well automated your processes are, um, the framework, how quickly can you roll back to a desired state mm -hmm. with backward compatibility, and ensuring that uh, you have necessary alerts in place so that if things were to go south, you can react very quickly and not have an en masse outage or an en masse um, users affected by that. Uh, Outcome. Yeah, you can turn it off in flighting just by saying if no, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and just set it to never happens, and then you can roll back the changes. Absolutely. Okay, that's great. Next question. Um, how do you decide when to use SAS versus PaaS? Dave. Okay, well, I, I think there's a lot of piece components to that. I mean, first is what are you trying to accomplish and how much of that is possible via the SaaS services? Um, for example, why would you ever build a, a calendaring solution in your own PaaS application if there's exchange services and calendaring services or that available to you to embed within your application? Same thing for document management and storage. Uh, use SharePoint or OneDrive services for the application. So again, use the, the, the services for what they're really good for to help speed along the PaaS app. It's not necessarily a choice as to one or the other. It's really more of a combination of how to apply both effectively. And really, it becomes a question of where is your UI going to be based? One of the things that we have to think about sometimes is, is am I building, a, for example, an Azure-based application, maybe consuming from Office 365 services to embed data or, um, or, 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 for example, ship from calendaring or, or OneDrive or whatever? Or am I building the experience in 365 directly and consuming from other data services uh, in, from, from it may be hosted in Azure? Um, and the new 365 models, for example, like, for example, the SharePoint framework model that's coming out, is designed, in fact, for that latter model to say, I can simply build an Office 365 application blending 365 data and services with, with data coming from other places from mm -hmm. the PaaS. There's, and that's, that's awesome on infrastructure SaaS determinations. David's spot on with uh, taking a hybrid application approach. But also as you move up the line to line of business, mm -hmm. um, there you have to do uh, business-based capability analysis yeah. to see if it meets your requirements. Um, and then you should do it, in, I've seen these done many times, you need to do it with the attitude of you're trying to move there. You're trying to fit. So the business the needs to maybe acquiesce on a couple mm -hmm. of 
issues because the product out of the box doesn't do it yet. Mm -hmm. not, uh, not say, oh, that's the reason not to go, and then right. they go off and spend millions of dollars on their own development. I think that's actually an important point is to, the, the, what, what point do you call closer to a product so you give yourself the most flexibility and simplicity and time, quick rapidity and time to market? Yeah. Um, often what we'll say is, look, if I can negotiate on these couple requirements and get closer to a core product, then I can get you a solution in maybe a matter of days or weeks mm -hmm. as opposed to maybe being more custom and with a risk that you're going to have to sustain what you built. And as the product evolves, am I going to really evolve as, uh, quickly with it? Right. A classic but example. Yeah. Well, also with the evolving of the product, you get new feature functionality regularly yes. that you would have to build yourself. Exactly. So there's that plus yeah. side to A it. classic example is typically when we talk of a SaaS application, these are really business productivity applications. And the use cases are very common, or at least 80% of the use cases are mm. common across the industry, mm. which means that there is tremendous investment that Microsoft has already made on the UX yeah. side of things, how the experience really comes out. For example, if you take, uh, where to take Dynamics 365 equivalents, right? The mm -hmm. UX itself is tailored exactly. so that the business process can be quickened. There's no one preventing you from just purely using these services and building your own UX, but the dollars that has been already invested in determining why a certain UX pattern helps for a sales executive or a marketing executive is already based. In, and that's where SaaS really helps you in uh, just you know, um, enabling it on for your users within your enterprise and you can hit the ground running and do very minimal customizations for your um, business specific niche needs that are required. The, prin the principle is be as out of the box as possible. Yeah. Right, and save your custom development for maybe the competitive advantage stuff, exactly. what's going to differentiate you. Yes, exactly. If, if you have to do that, yeah. 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 Right. You really, it's, it's hard. Inside Microsoft, we have cases where we have customized the heck out of our SaaS. Yeah, and that's where the backward mm -hmm. compatibility becomes a, yeah, yeah that's, that's a, a good point that Ken brings out about how sticking closer to the product uh, directives helps you also move forward, especially with the cloud. Um, features are being delivered at the pace of, you know, you, ev at least there is a new feature coming out once every two weeks. And that means you are up to date already versus in a traditional world, you still had the um, um, ability to go customize the heck out of it. Whereas in an online subscription world, you have a sandbox environment. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they are in a, in a framework wherein your forward compatibility is not restrained. And then in the old world, to upgrade to the latest version was a big effort, yep. a project over many yes. months right. often, and mm -hmm. integrating your custom with your out of box. It starts it right from the operating system to your uh, uh, low level uh, you know, uh, databases that are supporting your application and this whole stack and the mi data migration associated with it. So the gamut uh, involved six month to one year cycles mm -hmm. if everything went well, I mean that is. Yeah. yeah, for the large apps like SAP and yeah. some of the other big, big apps that we run. Yep. Yeah, and when you think about things like, let's say, Enterprise Portal or other solutions uh, on top of 365, your goal is to be evergreen. You don't want to have to deal with that upgrade process. You mm. want the product to upgrade and you just get the benefit. Yeah. Do we have any examples where uh, Microsoft IT has had to deploy a PaaS custom offering, custom developed uh, application or series of applications? Because SaaS, it, there wasn't enough common with the rest of the world to, to have a, a SaaS offering fit that bill. Do we have anything like that? Well, we've customized our SaaS services in many ways for, for yes, for that, for example. We have governance solutions on top of 365 that we have internally that help us manage that. Those are PaaS-based applications that manage the SaaS-based applications or additional mm. custom experiences that we build that in PaaS that augment and enhance the SaaS-based applications. So absolutely, we do that. And are you yeah, speaking of uh, our uh, provisioning system for the cloud? That, that's a good example, yes. Okay. We also have some unique business models that support what you're saying. Our um, licensing and mm -hmm. our, our set of products that Microsoft offers I is pretty huge breadth. You know, Apple is a monoculture on consumer devices. We have consumer, we have retail, we have um, uh, Commercial a enterprise, enterprise uh, yeah. many things. We have cloud infrastructure. We have so many different business models. So our licensing, our digital licensing and our di and enterprise agreements are all f unique. And so those are developed on paths. 
HR is a good example of that too. It's a bit, it's a mix. We've got you know SAP is the backbone, but we've built custom cloud solutions for things like Connect and Rewards. So our, our performance management processes are unique in a number of ways. And those are on PaaS. Yes, those are all PaaS. Yeah. But the bulk. Would you say the bulk of applications in HR are SaaS oriented? We get them out of the box or. Um, close, yeah. It's it's a maybe we're we're trending very heavily that way, but it's probably about half and half now. Yeah. And those are all solutions that we used to have on premises, where we ran all of the servers in our own data centers, exactly. and we moved them up into PaaS to save money and to be able to scale to be scalable. Is, are those yeah, the two and main to reasons? give access to everybody on any device. That's a huge mm -hmm. one. Okay, so. that's the big one. Yeah. And Mobility. speed and speed time to development. The whole point about, it, especially if I can. Build on cloud, SaaS and PaaS is to how can I how quickly can I go? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Time to market. Well, for HR too, we do our our performance evaluations once or twice a year, so there's probably a spike too. So it's about yeah. Being so able we to take handle. advantage of yeah. that auto scale capability. Yeah, when we were on prem, we had this big cluster of IS boxes sitting there all year long for the you know three days or whatever that they would actually get used. So yeah, yeah, it's so that's it's a more cost. efficient that way too. You know what's interesting about auto scale? When I first looked at the strategy, um, we analyzed the portfolio, and only five percent of our apps could readily take advantage of seasonality or auto scale dynamic capacity. But now that we're trying to optimize our infrastructure, we're kind of past the move it to the cloud or into optimizing the infrastructure. Um, a lot of the apps have been designed for their peak usage, mm -hmm. not their minimum usage. And when we look at And the telemetry is, is revealing this now. Yeah. And so if we design for minimum usage, I think I don't know the answer yet. We're just discovering this. I bet 80% of our applications could take advantage of elastic scale. Mm -hmm. And that could save us a lot of money. That's true. Yeah, and, and that kind of harkens to uh, a culture change that has to that mm. has to be implemented uh, in every uh, enterprise that is used to running their own hardware, and that is to change the hoarding mentality and to provision for the worst case uh, worst case scenario. Now you don't have to do that, and you shouldn't because you won't gain the benefits or the cost That's savings right. That's right. because of that. So there's a behavior change that yes. has to accompany the technology yeah. change. Yeah, the, the, your development culture has to change uh, from hoarding mm -hmm. your resources just in case you need them to just turn it off Turn it off when you don't need it and you can turn it right back on and you can enlarge it, you can scale it when you need to and you can scale it back when you don't. And that's something that's uh, a tough pill to swallow in some uh, development cultures. So the whole promise of public cloud is that the capacity planning process that uh, many IT organizations are, have to go through has been offloaded onto the public cloud providers like Microsoft because mm -hmm. we have done that for our data centers mm -hmm. and we anticipate a certain level of load that will be coming and we allow access to you, uh, access to resources on demand. So you as an application developer are focused on enabling your scenarios and catering to the needs of the spikes or what have you that you would encounter with your application. Not necessarily, hey, um, I just have to you know, build it for uh, this peak load always. It, is, uh, it has to be stateless. That's where the development culture is about uh, getting into stateless modes and that kind of applications comes into picture. Um, and a couple, couple that with the NoSQL movements and whatnot, mm -hmm. that is definitely gaining ground. And cloud definitely helps you accelerate that adoption. Uh, you, uh, if you were to build a NoSQL solution on an on-prem uh, infrastructure, that's not going to get you any benefits because uh, that would be detrimental to the cost. Uh, these are the paradigm shifts that we're seeing now. Yeah, our yeah, document DB solution is Absolutely. really awesome. Yes, I love it so much. Yep. So it becomes a new facet that you have to be able to learn exactly. in order to be effective exactly. uh, in, in, in your quiver of uh, tools and Absolutely. Yeah. So next question. Um, PaaS has evolved since we started out. So how is PaaS V2 different than classic PaaS? So classic PaaS is really what, what we originally just called the, the web worker role paradigm. So you had a web role was a, a web server, worker role was essentially kind of a Windows service type of thing, background process. Um, we've kind of, we've really taken that a couple steps up the stack with, with PaaS v2. So PaaS v2 would be, you know, your app service, uh, logic apps, uh, service fabric, these types of things, which, which really 
if you go to app service now, when you create a new app service, you, you're given, um, it's not just a, an IS solution. You can choose from a marketplace of uh, many different solutions for specific for mobile, mobile scenarios, different types of uh, web applications, an API app, uh, you know, MVC app, single page app, um, and that could be with, uh, you know, with our technologies, or it could also be, you know, some of the node, other types of code as well. So there, you can really take advantage of however you want to write your code, you can do that on top of an app service and, and get the benefits of, of PaaS. Um, it also gives us um, deployment efficiencies to do things like, you know, one-click deployment with continuous deployment, continuous integration. Um, and, and again, it has things like application insights built straight in. So we're really, we're really, everything we're doing now is, is taking advantage of the, the PASV2 models. Just to add on to that uh, aspect, especially the service fabric offering that we have, uh, that ensures that the density of your usage of compute resources, your CPU or memory, is very effective. So uh, think about your microservices architecture that SOA initially promised. And now it's really truly coming to the fore because you're able to deploy multiple roles on the service fabric cluster and it auto scales as per uh, the requirements of each roles or each microservices that you have. Um, so that is another paradigm shift in the development model as opposed to the traditional world wherein you would build a monolithic service and say, hey, this service does everything and um, everything for all or most of the uh, you know, organizations here. The focus is on microservices enabling one scenario uh, which you are confident will scale up and down as per the usage trends. Yeah, and, and Service Fabric is actually what we're running our services on. Things like SQL Database Absolutely. are all built on top of Service Fabric. Exactly. So this, we're really talking ultimate scale. Yeah, it's a yeah. tried and tested tool. The, um, the key word you mentioned is density. Yes. So when you move to the, the PAS v Duke model, you're moving from a, a, a good utilization to around 13% yep. CPU utilization. Yep. When you move to the, the density yeah. infrastructure, Service Fabric, application service environments, where you're sharing it, or the app services that you were talking about, um, web app services, mobile apps, API apps, um, logic apps, and Azure Functions, those things can run on shared infrastructures, and you only pay for CPU utilization. Absolutely. So now you're effectively 100% utilized. Yep. That's a dramatic wow. cost savings, 13% to 100%. That's huge. And with Azure Functions, you're even talking of serverless Lambda compute kind of scenarios, yeah. because, that's, uh, because not all SMBs would want a dedicated uh, service running, compute service. They're really interested in some hooks and uh, completing their workflow the business process workflow for which there is a gallery um, from which you can choose templates for your triggers, inputs, and outputs. And uh, that can set up your own workflow on the cloud uh, in a secure way. That is baked in. That's the key aspect that we want to take away out of it. And now it is a, almost a direct translation from the infrastructure capacity you're using and your cost of goods or cost of transactions. And like Eric is moving towards more business KPI metrics yep. up the stack. This makes it that much easier to, to deduce those. You don't have to worry about how things are running, so you start thinking about the efficiency of your yeah. application. And you said something uh, going up the stack. It uh, is also indicative of the workforce that we have going up the stack. Mm. Mm -hmm. Instead of uh, tinkering with hardware, patches, operating systems, things like that, we're all working on things higher up, higher value, uh, higher up the OSI stack, uh, and more centric to the user experience, and that's the big thing. Mm. Uh, we're, we're able to design things with the user experience in mind rather than deploying the technology and its limitations. Yep, I don't have to design SAN arrays anymore. Yep. <laughs> and that's a good thing. Uh, next question, how does Microsoft IT maintain compliance and pass audits with Office 365 offerings? Okay, well, there's, uh, I, I think there's a, a few First of all, out of the box paths here. The the out of the box product, the, there's a bunch with the, from the 365 Trust. Everything from you as the customer owns your data, we as IT own our data. Uh, you can choose to use customer lockbox so, you, so that uh, Microsoft can't access it at all without you know, your sign in. You can you literally own your own key for encryption, um, okay. all the way to um, you know all the all basically all the industry standards. I mean, uh, we have. 365 services that are pretty much passed. You can go to Trust Center. I'm not going to name all the acronyms, but there's a huge list of acronyms that 
uh, and certifications that the 365 Trust Center has done. Beyond that, though, from an enterprise standpoint, we do things like we have e-discovery running against 365 for both email and, and, and SharePoint and OneDrive to look for things like, you know, for the e-discovery scenarios or retention management and record center scenarios or DLP for just scanning things for what are my regulatory patterns that I need to deal with, what, are the, what, what confidentiality information might I have, where do I have to have credit card numbers that I need to protect. So scanning for patterns and dealing with that appropriately. We now with 365 has introduced the notion of, of groups and group classification. So using their enterprise can define your classification scheme out of a box in the Active Directory to say, hey, any group that gets created is going to be classified by whatever your scheme is. And then the user gets to define that. And then what kind of policies do apply to that? For example, we do things like if a new group has been created that is classified as HPI, we do, which is our, HPI is the I was going to say, is our definition of top secret. Basically, what is the utmost confidentiality in Microsoft? And if we find it as so, uh, something that's equivalent of top secret, we, we say, hey, it's a group, but it's a private group. It's not meant to be public. We're going to lock a thing down. We do things like that. We maybe turn off external sharing, external membership in certain scenarios. So we put all appropriate controls in place based on the classification of the content. And this is, again, there's layers of services available to you within what 365 provides, depending upon how far you want to go. And these are out of box, no secret yeah. sauce. Yep. No, not, no, not especially not for groups. We, we've had for SharePoint history, you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier the PaaS solutions we've had, because that's the other thing here. As I, because I've got the API model in place on top of 365, I can now build things, uh, services in PaaS that I want to manage this. I can run jobs that are managing and scanning my Active Directory groups, for example. I can run uh, jobs in Azure which are going to be managing my SharePoint sites, looking for expiration, looking for oversharing, um, we do all those things. Okay, very good. Next question. What major trends do you see for Microsoft's cloud adoption? Ken? Uh, major trends. So the, the first major trend um, that's happening right now inside Microsoft is um, after you lift and shift uh, the bulk of your um, on-premise workload into the cloud, um, the next major trend is optimizing. And so there's a number of tools at, in Azure and a number of tools that we've created ourselves to analyze the operational metrics and figure out which machines are over-provisioned. Um, we moved a lot of D14s, uh, lifted and shifted to D14s, and we're saying you could use a D3 or a D4 in those cases. And, and even if it's not like immediately a D3 or D4 um, all the time, you still can go to a D4, D3 uh, SKU, and then when needed, and you can schedule that with a, um, an Azure batch job to up that SKU and, and then go down the SKU. The only issue we've found in this optimization is that sometimes we have far more disks attached than uh, is supported when you go down mm -hmm. SKU. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of the tricks of the trade is to keep the number of disks uh, minimum so that you have that SKU flexibility. Mm -hmm. Um, so optimizing is, uh, is one key. Um, we've gone from around <coughs> 6 to 8 percent um, CPU utilization to around 13. I think when we're done, we'll hit somewhere near 20 uh, percent CPU utilization uh, on average for our, our division. Um, after that, in order to squeeze more out of it, we need to start refactoring for PaaS. Um, that involves uh, easy PaaS refactoring. It's like moving to Azure SQL. Um, some of the harder refactoring is moving to a microservice architecture. So that's the, I think that trend is just starting. We have a few examples of that internally, but I see a lot more of that happening over time. Okay. At least all the greenfield applications are now uh, starting to go off on Service Fabric and the new SQs. It's the traditional ones which become a Right, the ones that you lifted and shifted exactly. to get yeah. them into the cloud in yeah. the first place. Yeah. Okay. So the, the greenfield stuff, yeah. the, the stuff that's being developed now, yeah. Yeah. what kind of utilization are we seeing with the new stuff? Should be much higher. It should be much higher. Um, these things usually have one application on a five-node infrastructure. is a minimum of five in Service Fabric. I think with uh, application service environments four. Currently, we haven't mixed a whole bunch of apps operating in that. And so the utilization we expect to go up 
um, we're getting there. I, so I, I don't. I, these are early, and I don't have all the numbers. Do some you have of the, an so yeah, some of the services we run uh, on Service Fabric, we are seeing closer to 23 to 25 percent. That is, uh, we have we have five roles into the same cluster, yeah. uh, put across the globe. So, and again, we did not go to the D12s. We went to the lowest queues, and yeah. uh, it is at that stage that we are seeing uh, this uh, factor. What, what goal do you have? What uh, uh, percentage do you want to hit? So, uh, industry trends say that. Uh, a machine or the nodes can safely run up till 65 percent. Mm -hmm. So there is still a huge, uh, uh, you know, uh, delta. Room for improvement. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, we are not really targeting 65 percent in a year or so. Even if we were to reach 30, 35 in a year, that would be a great uh, mm -hmm. shift of, you know, uh, costs that we would be saving. For example, one other trend that we've started seeing from our own Azure subscriptions is they have started notifying about the cost that our compute uh, is utilizing for that subscription. So that also builds in a incentivizing model for you to, yeah. if, if the organization determines that, hey, you know what, you're not supposed to be uh, using so much with the numbers of utilization as to there's only so much being utilized. Are you really using it? Do you want to use it on demand? Do you want to shut it down for a time period or whatnot? Especially the dev test SKUs are the ones that always tend to get flagged yeah. because uh, in a model where we do not have 24-7 development cycles, uh, it is a scope wherein we could shut them down during the non Yeah, uh, we call that adjust. snooze, and we're, yeah. all be, mm -hmm. we're all highly motivated to snooze as much as possible. In other words, spin down the VMs. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And it's great that the portal is now starting to really help us with that. We can go in and look at our, our Azure SQL databases, and it will tell us that, hey, I've got this premium running. You know, based on your past three months, you could actually run this you know, at a S2 level, save yourself mm -hmm. several hundred bucks a month, and the, the portal actually proactively will help you do that. This is the paradigm shift that we are again talking about, right, constantly. Traditionally, you would go buy your hardware. That's your CapEx. You would buy your licenses. That's a one-time cost. Versus now, you are conscious about, hey, do, do I really require that? What is the scenario that I'm enabling with uh, that beefier machine or um, the higher-end licenses? So there's that flexibility. Now your group sees a bill, right? Yes. <laughs> and now Every has month. to budget to that yep. bill. There is a force working against this model that we've been talking about. Um, some products are charging by um, SKU, or sorry, by uh, installation. So mm -hmm. if you use a scale-out architecture and you have to pay an exorbitant license cost, that may be counterintuitive to what we've to been talking about. Instance. Instead, you go for the scaled-up unit yeah. because it saves you on license costs. True. It's, so there's a there's you know there's a business balance, but but now we have the data. Yeah. Now we, we have, have data. the cost data, yeah. which we didn't we didn't have before. True. Engineers yeah. have it every day. They yes. didn't have that before. So more incented now In to fact, be more efficient. I've been monitoring my organization by daily run rate. Mm -hmm. I know what my budget is. I look at my daily run rate every single day, and I look if it's above the red line or below the red line. And if it's above the red line, I start yelling. Yes. <laughs> okay, next question. Uh, Eric, you talked about Internet of Things or IoT t scenarios. Um, how does Azure help with those scenarios? So uh, Azure, Azure makes it really natural to plug into the platform. We've got with our Azure IoT suite, it includes an, an IoT hub, which is kind of built off similar architecture to Event Hub. But that will enable us to send events in from a number of you know, remote devices in a secure way that all get, you know, that will scale out as, long as, as far as we want to go. What we're doing with the work like productivity team now is we're deploying a, a set of commodity sensors into a number of different workspaces around uh, just the local campus here to kind of understand how employees are, are using their workspaces as we kind of transition from a, you know, an office, individual office-based model to more of a neighborhood collaborative model in a number of space, spaces. So we're really trying to figure out how employees are using those spaces, help them um, visualize, you know, when, where they can get free spaces, um, do some predictive ana analysis on where free spaces are going to be, and, and, and get that data to the RENF team so they can help with their space planning. So what that means is we've got, you know, motion, temperature, light data feeding into our IoT hub from, from sensors uh, from a number of different buildings around here, and we're collecting around, you know, two gigabytes a day of just sensor events coming in, which, you know, is it's a kind of a drop in the bucket in the larger IoT world, but, but it's a big set of data. And um, it's, it's really a new type of problem for us. You know, we talk about um, 
pushing up the stack here. I think that that's kind of that kind of applies here. It, it's I'm really excited about the new types of problems we're getting to solve now that we've kind of proven we can do you know the traditional LLB stuff in the cloud. Um, now we're looking at things like big data. We're looking at machine learning. And we're looking at how we can get you know real time visualizations of these data. Look how we could do kind of you know heat maps on how people are moving around, um, uh, and uh, and and do things like get a prediction of okay where you know when I come in in the morning where should I go to get a parking spot? You know, now where should I go to get a free focus room? Um, you know maybe I should uh, leave a little early today because uh, my meetings in you know on the on the other side of town and traffic's bad. Um, all this type of stuff we can really do if we if we process this data coming off of the IoT hub, and we're able to publish that to um, right now we're publishing it to Azure Data Lake, and we're also publishing it out through SignalR so other applications can tie in and build experiences across this the same data. And I know that um, when you find space, when you identify free space, sometimes it's a booked conference room that simply isn't being used. So it's giving more intelligence than what we have yep. with our scheduling. Yep, and we're tied in through uh, to Office 365 through the web services to view the, the booking information so we can find you know interesting patterns around, oh, this, you know, this room's booked, ever been booked for a weekly meeting here for the past three months, but nobody's ever showed up, so maybe we That's should right. look to, to repurpose that. So I like right? that intelligence. Yeah. And that, that also uh, applies to any line of business app for your enterprise that you're developing. Use the sensor data available with permission <laughs> to enhance the capabilities of your of your application. Right? What Again, features are being used with the ones user are not experience. Being used. Yeah. The user experience comes into play. You can think outside your proverbial box. Yeah. Helpful on many fronts. So how did we at Microsoft get people to adopt the cloud? Jim? You're talking to me? Okay. <laughs> um, it didn't take much. Uh, we used Office 365 and the capabilities there as the carrot to get people into the cloud to, to organically just flock to Office 365. The, the feature set is so rich there. Uh, and the accessibility from any device, anywhere, anytime, including their phones, their tablets, their iPads, whatever, uh, was sufficient to get mass adoption and viral adoption of things like uh, OneDrive and OneDrive for Business. They could simply get to their stuff without even thinking about it. So that's a pretty powerful incentive. So if couched properly, and if you have a, a, a concerted effort to educate your, your, your uh, user base, your, your people, as to the benefits of the cloud versus what they're traditionally used to using, it's almost, it almost becomes a no-brainer to adopt the cloud en masse. Well, a big part of that is setting the defaults, yep. right? So what, what Jim was referring to is, you know, you say, look, here's where your default next gen, what used to be my site is now. And as opposed to you having to use any of these other technologies or storing docs on-prem or on your machine, free your machine up so you could trash it and that doesn't matter. The docs are always in the cloud mm -hmm. now. And I think that changed the, that's changed the dynamic completely, what Jim was referring to. And, you know, you, you go further to say we've We've gone from eight terabytes of content, I think, when we started my site migration originally, to uh, we're now at uh, three quarters of a petabyte of content in OneDrive for Business now. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, massive adoption in just a few years. Mm -hmm. Mainly because of our employees' content came from out of a woodwork because they were storing it in other places they probably shouldn't have been storing it. Mm -hmm. And we're now doing the right thing, and IT's got the right level controls in place, um, and they're adopting their services because employees are that employee empowerment is a core kind of piece of our, our motto, model of if we can't empower employees, we're doing something wrong and they're going to work around us. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. Yeah, yeah always take the path, path of least resistance. And it sounds like we approach it with the what's in it for them. Absolutely. You have to convince someone yeah. that they're getting something better. In the early days, yeah, in the early days of our migration, uh, we opened up uh, Office 365 to open enrollment. If you, if you need a new site, uh, for your project or for your group or whatever, uh, 
feel free to open one up in the cloud. Uh, we're, we're grandfathering our on-premises uh, with some exceptions. But if you want something new, go, go to the cloud, provision a site, and have at it. And we found uh, people were preferring that over even using their old sites. They would simply self-migrate their content into the cloud yes. for the features that were available in the cloud. And that's a strategy that uh, I, I say other enterprises can adopt um, mm -hmm. yeah. to, uh, to, to further their, uh, their migration into the cloud. I can tell you what I love. I love that if my PC gets destroyed for whatever reason, I can get a new PC and all my data is there. I don't have to go to backups and restore right. anything. Yep. And that was a big um, kind of carrot for me mm -hmm. to want to have everything in one drive and in the cloud. And but it, it wasn't always like that no. uh, at Microsoft. In the early days, most people believed that the cloud was you know, not actionable, not real. Yeah. So we had to, and I think a lot of our customers will have the same issue, um, get CIO backing, get management backing, get it to be a strategic objective. And um, Jim mentioned about the value proposition uh, being there, but we had to pitch that to our managers and yeah. sell that. Mm -hmm. Well, and the security story to that point, to the yeah. management chain, it's not, even though we're Microsoft, just going to 365, for example, took a, a, bu a bunch of assessments to say, what are we willing to put in the cloud? Are we willing to put our top secret content there on day one? No. We're going to be willing to put our low and medium content up there initially, mm -hmm. and as controls develop, both from in product as well as what IT did, what does with it on top, we get to the point that we say now everything's in the cloud. But to your point, that that can, that management, that IT and, and chief security officer sell is in, in, in is an important stage. Yeah. In the beginning, you didn't have e-discovery. Right. We asked the Office 365 team to build that, mm -hmm. to to solve the legal subpoena requirements. Mm -hmm. You know those kinds of things. Uh, we didn't have data leakage protection. We didn't scan for HBI data on an MBI classified site. Yeah. Like, oh, there's a credit card on there. Is it, you didn't classify it right. You know, we didn't do those things. You know, those, so we couldn't move it all. Um, but a lot of the internal um, shingle on a web, internal little social sites that Jim was talking about, yeah, those all flocked there. Um, the hard, the, it's the 80-20 rule, right? 80% mm -hmm. uh, moved easily. The other 20 was the hard stuff. Mm -hmm. And that was a lot of work. Yeah. And SharePoint nailed it. They did a great job on it. Yeah. And we've reached a point where we are so confident to even put revenue, Microsoft financial data, up in the cloud. Yeah, yes. pre-earnings information, our board of directors right. has their Absolutely. information. Uh, yeah, no, we're, it's evolved it's all there. Yeah. Yeah. Since so we started. That's the level of maturity that we have reached. Yes, it's been a journey, and like Ken started off saying, there was a deterrent, and then how the leadership buy-in has a huge impact in helping that. Yeah. We are getting close to the end of our hour. So I do want to ask one final question to our SMEs. What is the one tip you would like to leave our audience with today? And Eric, can we start with you? Uh, sure. Um, I guess well, we've been talking a little bit about it, but I think that for me it's just thinking about how IT solutions are really changing in some exciting ways. I mean, we're, we're, we've gone beyond just building, you know, a simple web app or or uh, you know web services, relational database type of thing, and and w as we move into the cloud and we look at the the next generation of cloud services that are coming along, and and with the ma maturation of the the SaaS options, whether it's Office 365 or it's you know corporate SaaS uh, offerings for you know corporate functions, IT is going to be more about integrating this data and gaining insights and learnings from it. So we're going to be not just you know building telemetry, we're going to be building ways to integrate data in Azure Data Lake, SQL Data Warehouse, and build machine learning models on top of it to really gain new insights and, and, and predict how uh, things are going to behave in the new world. So I, I'm really excited about that, what, what that means for us building IT solutions going forward. Yeah, and, and to add to that, I'd say there are a couple of things. I think first, the, the models are evolving. I think how you would build solutions, for example, against SaaS services, I'll take 365 SharePoint, for example, mm. uh, uh, last year will be different You know, in, 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 in eight months. Things are improving. The models are, are getting better. The, the integration, we've got Microsoft Graph now as an API layer. We've got 
Uh, the SharePoint framework is a model to build on top of. So our way of, 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 of helping our customers build solutions and enabling our businesses to build solutions is, is, is improving. And I'd say, it, just to getting started, evaluate where you can let your businesses just get started themselves. Things like, you know, where does Power Apps and Microsoft Flow fit in terms of how do I help my business and empower them to build their simple solutions on 365, all the way up to now, how do I start to build the more complex applications? And those models do evolve. Um, as far as any advice, um, don't let the past practices uh, stymie you. Um, the cloud offers an infinite array of opportunity to re-evolve, to evolve yourself, uh, to take advantage of all these features. And like both of you have said, it's really an exciting time to be in IT uh, because of the opportunities of cloud mobility and everything that it represents. I'll add on to Jim's point here about how traditionally uh, getting an idea to fruition and to market would have been would have had a lot of speed bumps in terms of the infrastructure mm -hmm. procurement, in terms of uh, the number of doors you'd have to knock. And uh, with the cloud, what what uh, is enabled? It's an empowerment for developers and the creative force as a whole because they have all the tools in, at their disposition on demand to go accomplish test their scenarios out and hypothesize and um, experiment and then come out with creative means of uh, moving that needle to a more insightful uh, scenario rather than focusing on solving the infrastructure problem. And that's a huge uh, benefit that cloud is going to help the whole development community as a whole. Um, my advice, if you're just beginning, get commitment from your management. Uh, to do that, to see the value proposition, and work on that for your company. Um, realize that it's a technical and culture change. So you might be, it empowers that time to market empowers moving to an agile development model. And we have shifted uh, most of our, our teams to an agile development model. Um, so, and then getting it to be a planful activity, not just a haphazard organic activity, mm -hmm. because you need to get to the cloud in order to uh, gain a competitive advantage. Um, the companies that get there first, that embrace it, will get those competitive advantages. The ones that don't, that stay behind, will have um, an IT cost structure that's not in line with the rest of the industry. So my advice is to start planning, um, get your management lined up, get your teams agile, and get uh, an application uh, portfolio plan to prioritize the movement. Okay, we are at near the end of our session today. We have a question out there. We would love to get your feedback on this session, uh, what you thought about it. So please take a moment to answer the question. I want to close with thanking our SMEs for taking time away from your day jobs to come here and talk to our customers. It's truly a very important thing that we do. I want to thank our customers for joining us today. We love the questions, the dialogue, and the opportunity to come talk to you. The video for this session will be posted at Microsoft.com slash IT Showcase. Um, and at that location, you can find future live events. We hope you join us. We hope you bring your colleagues with us. You can also find a wealth of information about how Microsoft does IT at the Microsoft.com slash IT Showcase site technical case studies, articles, business case studies, even productivity guides. How do we get our employees up to speed on the latest and greatest technologies? You can find those guides there, take them, and use them within your own organizations. So um, thank you for joining us today, and have a great day.